think we're on. All right, good morning. Hey, good morning, guys. Happy Saturday Happy to you. Happy Saturday. We're here. It's yep. um, almost at the end of April. I know, it's the 24th of April. We finally have rain today, so we're actually waking up to some rain. We're we pretty are excited about that. So happy. I know we're kind of weird in the Pacific Northwest. <laughs> like we had like near summer, well, basically summer weather for yeah. a couple weeks, like in 80 degree weather. It was really warm. We you never guys. get that here. Not so. in April. We're all rejoicing because we yep. get rain. Yep, yep, and so, that means we don't have to water. I know, I'm <laughs> and our rain barrels hopefully will fill up a little yep. bit. So yeah, we finished another one yesterday. Finally got it hooked up. I know. So, yeah, that was yeah. exciting. Yep, yeah. So how are you guys doing yeah, this morning? How are you? Yeah. Let yeah. us know what's going on in your garden. We've got um, we've got a really fun um, show ahead. Oh, yeah. we've, we're going to be talking about hummingbirds today. Hummingbirds. Yep, those little buzzers that come by and expect you to feed them all the time and. They're birds with attitudes. They really do have it. If you've never <laughs> invited them into your yard, they are hilarious to watch. They're oh, yeah. super territorial. They're feisty, oh. um, but they're so beautiful and so awesome to watch. Yep. And they can be interactive too. They can buzz you. They can um, they can come up and look at you through the window and go, "Hey, I'm ready to be fed. Where's oh, they my do. food?" Yeah, they'll tell you. I mean, they'll let us, let us know if yeah, our. They're they're funny that way. Yeah, they're hilarious. So yeah. we we're excited to get into that. We're going to talk a lot about um, different plants and flowers you can add to your yard um, during different seasons. So yep. we thought that would be a fun way to kind of present this to and you. Then, yeah, and then other ways to attract them to make it so you have a very hospitable. Uh, inviting garden too. So there's there's a couple other things to do besides just bringing the flowers. Yeah, oh, it's so, so there's yeah. some awesome, yeah, so many oh. beautiful flowers you can add too that are just so mm -hmm. beneficial for other reasons as well. Yeah, so, so, yeah, so yeah. Um, we are so thankful you're here with us. Let us know who's here in the chat. Um, drop in, you yeah. know, say hi. Yeah. Uh, let us know what your hummingbird questions are or any of your garden questions because yeah, totally. we're, we're, we're here to help. So we've got some plants to show you. Um, yeah, we're just gonna kind of dive in, I think, right? Yep, yep, totally. Yep, and if you don't know, I'm Sean. I was just thinking This that. is Allison, we we're didn't... Spoken Garden. We're here to help you become a better gardener. Yay. If this is your first time here, welcome. So, yeah. Yeah, we go live every Saturday morning at 9 a.m. Pacific yep, Standard yep. Time just to chat with you guys and just check in and talk about some type of garden topic. Yep. So good morning to Real Jingy and Jay hey, Harrison, Jing. Delfina. Jay. Good morning, Delfina. We're so happy you guys are here. Awesome. Can't wait to catch up with you and see what's going on. Yeah. And make sure you got your coffee or tea. Coffee or tea. Woo. So um, yeah, we've got some awesome stuff coming up. So I guess yeah. What um, what do you guys have? What are your garden plans this weekend, you guys? Yeah. Do you have yeah. anything going on? Any big projects or? Yeah. Doing anything for hummingbirds? Oh yeah, hummingbirds. Ah. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's get to it. Okay, okay so we're we going to start with our mm -hmm. weekly mm -hmm. questions. Mm -hmm. So we've got lots of really good questions. We have to apologize to you guys as well. We're really behind on our comments really? and questions on YouTube oh. right now. So we're working really hard to get caught up yeah, on that. A little bit every day. We're so, going to get there. So if we haven't gotten back to you yet, we're sorry, but we will get back, we're gonna to, get your, back to, you. to your comment or question. So hopefully if yeah. you're here watching, maybe we'll answer your question live. Otherwise, yeah, yeah please be patient. We're going to get to you. We feel really bad we haven't been able to kind of get to all those yet. Yeah, but sorry, guys. And just to, and to let you know, uh, the questions we're going to talk about today, they're from this previous week, from uh, viewers, from a lot of different videos that we've had out for either a little bit, you know, for, for a while now, or that just came out that are more recent. So that's when we, that's where we usually pull these, uh, these questions. Yeah, so. definitely. Okay, so... Hmm. Let's see. So, very yeah. first uh, topic is about gladiolus bulbs because we we could probably talk about this for oh yeah well for and, the rest of the year. And we, we did love have them. quite a talk session about it a couple of Saturdays. We ago. did. That was a lot of fun. So yeah. we still have questions coming in and keep them coming. Yeah, and these are top of mind. Gladiolus are really top of mind. Going on right now. They're growing and doing their thing. Now I so. I completely apologize if I mispronounce your name. I'm sorry. Um, is it Rakabite? I think so. Jahanadab. I, okay. Good job. Yeah. So I'm sorry. Um, do you remove the bulbs for winter and replant them in the spring, or can you leave them in the ground? So, so gladiolus bulbs, yeah. can you remove them, or do you leave them in the ground? It's a great question, and it depends. It depends. <laughs> so as always in yeah. gardening, right? So uh, with with bulbs, you know, you want to check and see uh, if the bulbs are hardy in your area, and one way to do that is to know which zone you and your garden live in, where you're located at. And so for us, uh, as an example, we're in zone 8B. And so uh, we have a specific, you know, that's, that's temperatures, excuse me. What goes into these zonings is, you know, um, your, your, your extreme temperatures, especially your cold extreme temperatures and average temperatures and some other things. Uh, but basically it comes down to cold temperatures and what plants 
are capable of growing in in those you know under those conditions so um, for us in zone 8b we can plant gladiolus bulbs in the ground and we can leave them in the ground forever right now our zone is 8b it might change because of you know change in the climates mm. but hopefully not but hopefully not. yeah um but in our zone we can just leave them in the ground we don't have to dig them up every year in the in the fall or the winter and store them until the next spring now if you live in say uh, a zone below eight um if you so let me back up actually so gladiolus bulbs are hardy and can grow in zones two through and this is the usda hardiness zones grow in zones two through 11. But that's a big range. It's huge yeah, range, right? Yeah, that's a really big range. So, but if you live in zones, any in the zones between two and seven, then you're gonna need to dig up the gladiolus bulbs in the fall or winter and store them and then bring them back out this in the next spring to then plant again. And the reason is because gladiolus bulbs in those zones, it, it's not hardy in those zones. It's not hardy enough to survive winters, those cold winters, with those cold temperatures in those zones. Now, in, if you live in a zone, uh, zones eight through 11, then you can actually plant the bulbs in the ground and leave them. You don't need to dig them up. So um, I hope that helps. Yeah, it depends on um, what zone you live yeah, in. Yeah, it really and does. What you need to do because of that. Yep, exactly. Because of those cold temperatures. Yep, yep. We feel, um, we feel, we do feel lucky that we live in zone 8B because we do, we leave everything in the ground. Yeah, we kind of do. I think we would forget. <laughs> Yeah, I feel would. like we get so busy and so wrapped up in other projects that we would yeah. probably forget to pull them all out yeah. and then we, we'd lose them. We're kind of spoiled here with our climate. I know. We really are. We live in a very warmish maritime weather climate and um, yeah, it's it's kind of nice. Not to brag, but just, it's you know, just we're, um, we're spoiled. That's what we're used to. Yep, you know, most We have a lot of friends on the eastern side of our state here yeah. that they, they have to dig everything up. So they're... Yeah. You know that's more scheduled for them and they're just used to that it's a lot so, harsher climate over yeah there. it's a lot colder yep. and so yeah so yeah that's cool but yeah so hopefully we helped answer your question i hope that helps and hopefully you're putting in tons of beautiful gladiolus yes bulbs. yes yes so moving so, on to dracenas this Coffee. is from our video from a few weeks or a month mm. ago maybe um repotting our dracena plant actually that was like last fall if i remember right last spring so or was last spring yeah last spring i've lost track of time it's okay um, so the question was from Jessica Hopped, who, or Hoped, um, sorry if I said that wrong, um, can Dracaena be divided? That's so interesting. It's a really good question, yeah, because... Dracaenas are pretty cool. So Dracaenas, the, the, so the Dracaenas that we have in our video, that we showed you in our video, that we transplanted, they grow, um, they grow from a crown, they, they grow, uh, there's, there's the crown area, so crowns are kind of used in a different way. Uh, throughout gardening sometimes people talk about crowns as this is do you see guys yeah you guys can see that this is the plant crown you know some people refer to this as the crown some people refer to and how we refer to it as the crown is the uh, intersection between the stems and the roots and so that's where we kind of talk about the crown and that can be just where the actual stems meet the roots or where there's actually the stems meeting the roots, but there's this mat and there's this mass of, um, of stems that actually then grow up from this mat, and that's still considered a crown. So, but in this case, for the Dracaenas, they have a crown where just, just like this plant that I just showed you, the shoots meet the roots and that's it. They don't have multiple stems coming out of that crown area, that intersection of roots and shoots. So, um, they don't have a crown uh, to divide. Yeah. Now, if you think of a sense. crown as having those multiple shoots, like I was just describing in that mat form, that's something like a campanula or a shasta daisy or other plants that actually form that crown, that mat, and they have all these different shoots coming up. You can divide those. Yeah. Those, like those you can. Too, yeah, right? yeah, those. Yeah, definitely. Those you can divide and then separate and have, have, from one plant have two plants. With the Dracaena, it just has the one central crown uh, leader. It just has that one stem coming out of it. And so you can't divide that type of plant. Now what you can do, and what we've seen with Dracaenas, is we've had Dracaenas either have some dieback, and we've had to cut part of that stem, that main trunk, off. And then we've seen another side shoot come off yeah, that main cool. stem. It's regrown. It's reestablished itself that way. But... Um, 
it will not it will not grow multiple stems uh, from that trunk down below uh, off of any mat. There is no mat, so from that standpoint, you cannot divide it. So how, I so, wonder how you can propagate them if you have. I wonder if you could can you take a cutting. So that'd be interesting. What, what I've done in the past, this is way before you and I met. <laughs> uh, what I've done in the past is uh, my brother actually had what's called a corn dracaena. Um, I'm not familiar with that. And, and they're they're mainly an indoor plant. They look like they look similar to what we have, except they're just a lot greener. They're lusher, and they're just kept indoors. Cool. And they just kind of look like a corn stalk, kind of. Oh, that but they're beautiful. also they're, oh. they have that that dracaena leaf coming off of it. Yeah. But they're bright, bright green. And maybe you've seen them too. Cool. So basically, what I did with that is is uh, my brother gave me one of those plants, uh, one of his plants, and I said I want more of these. So what I did was is, excuse me, I I read up on it a little bit. I I heard that you can basically cut part of the stem off, strip the leaves, and then take it and stick that stem, that cut stem, into soil, and it would re-root oh, cool. like that. You just kept it watered and kept it going, and you'd have a new plant. So with this, with the dracaenas we have that we showed in our video, I'm not sure you can do that because I've never tried that before and I've never read anything on that before, but it might be worth a try. Sounds interesting. Um, if you have a very healthy plant, something that you could try um, if you wanted to produce a new plant from that plant yeah. is go along the stem, cut it and remove the top portion, stick that top portion that you just cut into some soil and like potting soil in a pot and try and reroot it I and just try water that it. Now. And it might actually do it, but it needs to be healthy. And so mm -hmm. the reason is, is because not only do you want a healthy cutting to try and propagate, but you want the base of the plant that you cut that top from to regrow another shoot yeah. off of its stem to reestablish that top, top portion of that plant. That's so cool. And so. if you guys have been with us for a while, you know we're total nerds and we love trying experiments <laughs> or, you know, experimenting on different things. So you've piqued my interest. Now I really want uh -oh. to try that. Which and one? I'm thinking, well, we have we're, so many. We're not going to cut from the front ones, are we? Probably not. If you okay, guys, um, we've got to show you some, up, like maybe upcoming soon, we've got to show you our dracaenas mm. that we have in our front yard because they look like, they're starting to look like palm trees. They're huge. They're huge. We had um, recent, or this video was referring to the video um, last he said it was spring. It was like where last we spring repotted last spring. them. Yeah, we we needed to because they were way overgrown in their way, pots. Yeah, and way too big for the pot. Yeah, we yeah. we got a huge pot for each of them. And and it took some doing. They're huge. I remember it took some doing to get that. Yeah, those were hard to get out. The of. roots and the uh, plant out of the pot because it was just thick. They were it was root bound like. We had to almost break oh, the pot to get yeah, it out. Yeah, we it almost was, did. And I was really sad because I loved that pot. But we saved it. So saved that's it. good. We saved the plant out of the pot. The, everything. Everybody wins. <laughs> No plants win, or pots win. were harmed in the making of thank, that video. Thank goodness. <laughs> so anyway, that's a cool uh, thought though for Dracaena, maybe taking cuttings and trying or trying to um, root it, like yes. you said, like take yeah. a stem piece off. And but do do your own research. That's cool. Yeah, do some research um, um, and maybe we'll. Uh, sounds like we might be trying this I think in the we future. Might. So I think we might. Yeah. So cool. Um, let's see. That helped. Yeah, I know. So real quick, good morning, Kim Matlock. Thanks oh, for joining good morning, us. Kim. Um, and yeah, we've got some. Oh, and Kim. Congratulations again on oh, yeah. winning winning the giveaway on our book. I know, yay! Cool. So, so Kim and Rosie Thurman, Rosie Thurman. are our winners for yeah. our book giveaway from last week yeah. for YouTube. So that was um, there they are. <laughs> you guys were freaking out. Our book comes out on Tuesday. It's like it's yes. I can't it's believe just, it's finally it's like, here. We've been wow. waiting. It's it's felt like a really long time because with COVID, it kept. I think we've told you guys, but it kept getting pushed back. Like our. Yeah. Our release date, our published date for our book was supposed to be February 2nd. Yeah. Then it was the 9th, and then it just kept changing. Every week we get a new email, oh, it's going to be two or three more weeks out. And we were just so bummed. We, we were crushed. We weren't sure if it was actually going to happen. I know, we really didn't. Apparently it was stuck on a so, container ship in from, on the West Coast somewhere. From China. So we were like, yeah. ah, man, is it ever going to come out? Yep. So, so we were hoping and praying, and it's finally here, you it's guys. Here. It's coming on Tuesday. Yep. We're kind of just like... Yep, yep. Really, yeah, it's but it's exciting. It's so and again, congratulations to Kim and Rosie Thurman. Oh, Rosie's here too. Rosie, yay! yay. Good morning, Rosie. Morning, Rosie. We're so excited for you guys. Yay! Yep. It's always fun to win things. Too, it is. You know, so it's, it's just fun. <laughs> cool. Okay, moving on. So moving we've talked about Dracaenas. We've talked about um, gladiolus bulbs, and I know Jay Harrison had a comment. Oh. Um, dug up gladiolus bulbs and replanted them into pots that's cool cool um, when the blooms wow. are gone i'll put the pots in the backyard then plant zinnias where the pots were cool that's a fun plan yeah what oh. kind of zinnias always now, always a good idea to plant zinnias zinnias you guys yep. we you probably know how much we love zinnias sean trialed them in grad school and researched with them and 
I love them because they look like daisies and they're just so beautiful. They're beautiful. I think we're growing 10 or 11. Oh, 11. Is it, or is it 12? It's now? 11 or 12 different types I think of zinnias. It's 12 now. Kim, we're not at your level yet. You'll have to keep us posted because <laughs> we love your email. You're growing, I think it was over 20 different zinnias. Yeah, kinds of that is so zinnias. cool. We are so jealous. And we can't oh wait to hear the like selection that I you're know. growing. That sounds so fun. Sounds awesome. So you guys, last week, a lot of you were here. We talked about moon gardens, right? Mm -hmm. And we all got excited. You guys, I literally went out right after that and ordered a whole bunch of those seeds we were talking about. She went downstairs, got on a couple different websites. Eden Brothers. Eden Brothers and... Botanical Interest and got a whole bunch. Of it's a bunch that we yeah. all were excited about collectively. So I'm so curious if any of you like purchased some seeds over oh, the yeah. week. Yeah. Did you guys go do the same thing? Did, did it pique your interest? Did you go get a specific plant? What were those? I know. We'd yeah. love to hear it. I know. I want to hear it. So, okay. Um, let's see. What are we talking about next? African daisies. African daisies. How to deadhead African daisies. We had a really good question um, on from, a previous video that we posted. It was the one about how to care for and deadhead African daisies. Yeah, it was about, okay, yep. so from KL was the um, audience member, so thank you for your question. Mm -hmm. So the question is, how long should I see, start over, how long um, until I should see my African daisies rebloom after deadheading them? So... After deadheading them, and she, uh, this, per, uh, this viewer waited about a week, and they haven't rebloomed yet. So they're wondering how long does it take after like deadheading for something to rebloom? Yeah. In this case, African daisies, and then wondered why. Yeah, it's a really good question. Why they hadn't seen anything um, yet? Because yeah, I mean, we go through and we, we show you at least in that video and a, actually a couple other videos, a bunch of other videos about how to deadhead plants and specifics on those. But you want you deadhead because you want more blooms. Right. Well, so the thing is, is um, when you're looking at the plant, sometimes it's it's interesting to just mentally back up with the plant, and um, and say, well, you know, how am I how am I caring for the plant? Is it healthy? Is it growing? Does it have blooms coming in? And then, you know, am I fertilizing? Am I keeping it on a regular uh, watering schedule? And those things really influence you know, those, those upcoming blooms, those blooms coming in next. The other thing, especially with like African daisies and plants that love full sun, they need to have full sun. They need that exposure to that full sun to still trigger that plant to biologically, biochemically produce those flowers. So with the full sun, with the regular watering, with um, any fertilizing that you can do, this all works in your favor to uh, have those blooms coming up next behind the current blooms that are either currently blooming or, uh, or or fading and they're withering and you need to cut them and deadhead them. Do you want me to grab the plant? Yeah, okay, yeah. do you mind? Or I yeah. can do it. We have um, props. Yeah, we've got props today, guys. So we've got our African daisy that we kept over over the winter and you can see. It's, it's regrowing from the bottom right now. So really it's doing really well, actually. Top heavy so right let's now. move that guy out of the way. And then move. Okay, that's not in the way. <laughs> okay, so you can see our African yeah. daisy here. It's looking really good. We got a little bit of maintenance to do on some of these older leaves and stuff, but that's just normal for overwintering a plant and getting it ready for the next season. So, we love me. the color of this too. It's yep. like this beautiful kind of burgundy. So you can see Kale that, um, and everybody else watching that, um, this this plant's really really close to opening up these full blooms. So One is actually things. starting to do it. We've got others here that are just really close behind it. Um, so. Um, you mentioned kale that you bought the plant. It was flowering when you bought it from the nursery, and then you got it home, and then um, it was still flowering. Then you deadheaded it from the withered flowers, the withered um, yeah, the withered flowers there, and now it hasn't rebloomed yet. Well, something you want to keep in mind too, not only with the full sun exposure, uh, the regular watering and fertilizing, but you also want to make sure that you realize that the nurseries force a lot of these plants yeah. to flower, so they're more marketable. Right? I mean, uh, a plant that's not flowering isn't as appealing as something that has this bright, beautiful flower color, and you're like, I want one of those. Right. So that's something to keep in, in mind too, Kale, when, when you're thinking about your plant. So you got the plant home. It's awesome. I'm sure it's healthy. I'm sure you're taking really good care of it, and you're giving it an, you know, the regular water, fertilizer, and enough sun. Um, just keep in mind that um, depending on where you live, um, and how long your day lengths are and how much sun you're giving it is going to influence that rebloom, the next blooms coming up. When you look at your plant too, um, you can see uh, down below, you can see new blooms in, in these different areas. There's blooms right here There's below below this one. So you can see that too. Something to keep in mind when you're um, 
to notice so you can anticipate when it's going to flower next is the blooms up top but then the blooms down below and when it's coming up what's coming up next and um, you can see down below to anticipate these have blooms right here that I can see below these other ones maybe you see those now maybe you don't but um, it's just something to keep in mind and look for yeah. when you're deadheading to anticipate when it's going to bloom next. Um, so, you know, the other thing is, is your timeline for um, it's been a week since you deadheaded and nothing's come up yet. That's okay. That's kind of normal right now because you can see ours uh, from a standpoint of time. It's just now starting to bloom. Mm -hmm. And this plant has been growing since last year and naturally through the lengthening of the daylight and um, our climate here. It's just now starting to bloom. And what is it? It's almost the end of April. So where you might be living, you might be in a similar light location or day length uh, location. So really what you're seeing here is more normal, a more natural type of reaction uh, for an African daisy to, um, to start flowering. And again, you bought yours. It was in full bloom because it was forced most of, more likely. Yeah. And so to anticipate the next flush of blooms, give it a couple more weeks. Yeah, it's that patience thing, right? Yeah. We want it like right away. Yeah, right. And the the industry Thank definitely you. plays to our uh, impulsiveness by forcing oh, yeah. all of these, you know, way oh, yeah. ahead of the season where they normally would grow. Yeah. So, yeah. it's um, yeah, this we were pretty proud of this because we this is not actually hardy in our zone. Mm -mm. So this is actually down to about nine A, nine B. Something like that, yeah. So we're eight yeah. B. So we were like, yay, we got this to. Yeah. So we overwintered quite we, a bit. We overwintered it, but it was in our greenhouse. It was in we our greenhouse. It I know we kind of cheated. So, but. so Kim, we hope that helps you. Or Kale, sorry, not Kim. Kale. Uh, yeah. Kale, we hope that helps you um, anticipate and uh, anticipate your next flush of, uh, of flowers. Remember to just keep it watered regularly. Uh, fertilize it if and when you can and give it that full sunlight and I would say at least six hours if not more of full direct sunlight to really prompt the plant to then produce uh, those flowers because that's what's gonna that's what it's gonna take and I would add be patient yes right? yeah <laughs> patience <laughs> is, hard. is hard it's really hard with gardeners I mean Allison and I are the same way it's like we want it I'm we know what we want we want it now like last week like after our moon garden episode like I said oh, I yeah. went out and bought I went, well, I didn't went, I went online and purchased probably six of the moon garden seeds that we showed you guys. Yep, yep. Because we're like, we gotta have them. So, impulsive. It was, yeah. But thank you, Thank Kale, you for your question. For your question. Hope that helps. I know. And you guys, we've got some great, um, oh, cool. more people have joined in with our live. We wanted to say right. a quick shout out. Good morning to Andrea B. Good Hi, morning. Andrea. Allison Tokley, which um, morning, Allison. we've, we've been meaning to write you back on your comment about, um, I believe you commented on our daffodil video, Allison. And, oh. We were just talking about this this morning, actually. Oh. Um, you had mentioned that you wanted some help with a shrub that kind of, um, a reblooming shrub, I believe, oh, for like a yes. raised garden area, I yes. think. Or, or a shrub that keeps coming back or, or something. Maybe spring, summer bloomer or something yes, like that. Something to pair with your um, your tulips. So we'd love to help you with that yeah. if you're, you know, if you want to um, drop your question in the chat, we'll see what we can do. Yeah. But pictures are always helpful. You mentioned maybe sending us a picture. Yeah, definitely email us. Yeah. At, uh, I was going to say, so Sean and Allison at SpokenGarden.com. Yep, yep. We'll get right back to you. So, um, and let's see. Good morning. I said Andrea B. Good morning. And I think that was it. But we're so happy you're all That's here cool. with us. This is really fun. Woohoo! We got the crew together this so, morning. I know. And they're talking about the plants. We're going to get to the plants. I know. I can't <laughs> wait to show you guys. We've got a couple uh -oh. of fun new ones. Okay. That's fun. So, um, <laughs> and you you guys would probably like this one. Oh, this is one of my yeah. new favorites right here. Yeah. So, we'll, we'll yeah. be talking about that in a minute. Let's see. Okay. So moving on to edging. So we mm -hmm. made a video last spring about, um, or summer, about edging ideas to keep mulch in place. Mm. Not your lawn, but mulch, because we have mulch different types all over our garden. And you know, sometimes it spills and- Or jumps out. It, it, it gets it out travels. of its, it gets out of its lane and we want to keep it in its lane. Um, so, yeah, right. <laughs> so from, it looks like the name is Samurai? Samurai, Samurai Udon. 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 Okay. Yeah. So I love, okay. Love these names. I so, know. Great name. So the question is, how about keeping mulch from running off into the sidewalk? So I'm trying to establish a clover lawn, but the thunderstorms in Texas are washing it all down the slope. Mm, sorry. I'm sorry. trying to avoid plastic or metal edging mm. though. So any suggestions? Thank you. Yeah, so um, great question. Sorry you're going through that, Samurai Udon. Um, so two materials that you can use besides metal and plastic. You can use concrete or cement. And that can be formed in a lot of different shapes and sizes. 
uh, depending on what your needs are. It also can be dyed. They can dye it different yeah. colors. I mean, there can be brown, gray, um, slate. Um, there's even, I want to say, cream? No. It's, it's a really light color. Hmm. It's, it's an interesting color. Or ceramic. I don't think I've ever seen that. Maybe ceramic, maybe. But hmm. so, you know, definitely concrete. And they, they can be thin and tall. They can be uh, very narrow or they can be wide. Um, it just depends on what you need and where you want to go get it. I know, okay, big box store time. Home Depot has a lot of different uh, kinds of, uh, of cement edging that you can look at. They usually put them on like the end caps of the aisles. Yeah. And you can, um, right. they're just a nice display and you can kind of fool around with it. Sometimes it's kind of interactive mm -hmm. too. Um, the other material is wood. Now, wood, you might think, well, you know, I, it's going to rot, it's going to deteriorate, and that's true. Um, but it's a it's a choice. It's a it's something that you uh, it, it's an option. So you can get treated wood, untreated wood. You can get cedar, hemlock. Um, you can get a lot of or even juniper. So the cedar and the junipers are going to last a lot longer without any chemical treatment. Naturally, they're just really tough wood that it lasts up here at least in the Pacific Northwest a really long time. Yeah. Now down in Texas, might be a completely different uh, different animal down there. So. But so cement or wood, and when you're putting in um, either one of those materials or something else as that edging to keep the mulch in place and not run down, give it a lip. Have it come up. You know, you're going to have your hillside come down, and here's a sidewalk. Give your edging between your hillside and your sidewalk, give it a lip. Give it, you know, maybe an inch, maybe inch and a half or two inches, depending on how steep of a, uh, of a slope you have coming down to that area and how much material. Uh, thick you have on there and so you know with that lip that edge coming up that's going to help keep everything from spilling over on the sidewalk something to consider maybe you've already thought about it um, also what we've seen up here um, what we do too is when we come down to some type of interface like that with the hillside and then um, there's the like concrete like a driveway or a sidewalk you can have um, that edging there if you don't have that edging you can trench you can bring down the, um, instead of having an actual physical barrier there, you can trench down on the side of the sidewalk and put a little lip, an indented lip going down. It's almost like a reverse mm. uh, edging. And then what you do is you take your mulch material and pack it in there and kind of thicken it up. And that could stop some flow of the other mulch coming down over the top of it. It might just basically create a, like a natural dam and back it up this way. So a couple of things to think about. No, that's always kind of a an issue, I guess. Whenever mm -hmm. you have any kind of slope and you're using a mulch, any type of mulch, mm -hmm. right, it's going to slide. It Gravity's is. just naturally going to bring it down. Water's mm -hmm. going to bring it down. Yep. So um, I love those options. You could also, could we also add maybe just, maybe you have some big rock around, like in your yeah, yard. You, you could just kind rock. of make your sure. own rock border. Yeah, if they're available and yeah. you, you don't mind the look, you, that's the look you're going for, sure. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it would maybe potentially heat up the surrounding area around it. So if that's yeah. not a good option because it's next to your lawn and it would kind of yeah, you might we'll, fry that area, you yeah, know. Yeah, and and the concrete, the sidewalk might already be doing that. That's a good point. So yeah, yeah, depending on what you're doing. But um, I was just going to make a point, now I can't remember. Oh, the mulch you're using. So more you coffee. said you said yes, more coffee. <laughs> Always the answer is more coffee. Um, depending on the mulch you're using to put over your clover seed, because you're trying to get a clover lawn going from your um, from your comment. Depend if you're using like if you're using a straw. That's good because that, that's big, it interlaces, it locks. Um, uh, if you're using something else that's a little bit finer, that might be an issue too where it is sliding down, it is moving, and you don't want that movement when you're trying to establish seed like that and put something over that. So yeah. consider what you're using too as a mulch. You didn't mention that in your question, so just kind of taking your question on a different uh, different little avenue there, but consider that too. I always think straw is such a cool mulch, but it blows away. I just, well, right? in, our, in our climate, it does. I mean, it yeah, just kind of it wet. disappears. So yeah. it's kind of, yeah. I guess, yeah, you got to keep it wet so it's heavier. But, but and if you're if you're establishing some type of lawn or anything, you're probably putting some water down on it on a regular basis. Right. So hopefully that's keeping that down. But again, you're on a slope. Yeah, all these things factor in. So, but hopefully that helped. Yeah, and if you need any more so, help with that, just let us know. Yeah, sure. Maybe we'll, we can bounce some ideas off. Totally. Of, you know. Oh yeah. Um, Okay, cool. So edging. Mm, Do we have mm, any other mm. questions? Edging. There might be one. One more question one and then more. we're going to get to hummingbirds. So, okay. <laughs> so violas. So cute. Such oh, beautiful delicate, plants. beautiful little plants. We yeah. love violas. We did a viola plant chat, which 
if you're not familiar, we do every Friday, we, f mm. we feature one plant from our yard because we just, you know, we're plant obsessed around here. <laughs> we, we can't seem to, we to stop to talking yeah. about it. It comes with the territory. It just cups, you know. <laughs> so violas, we, we featured um, a little bit earlier when, oh, we still have them in bloom right now. Oh, but. yeah. Now the question came, comes from Lisa Galanda Martinez. So thank you for your question, yeah. Lisa. Thank you, um, Lisa. My violas are wilting. I water it daily and it wilts. Then it comes back looking nice. Mm -hmm. What is happening? It's a good question. And a lot of people, we've been getting a lot of these questions throughout this whole spring on a lot of different types of plants, whether potted or in the ground yeah. or, or even indoors. Um, so, uh, wilting. Wilting, yeah. It, it's funny. People think, you know, something's wrong with my plant when it wilts and it's like, yes, there is, but most people think, you know, it's wilting because it doesn't have enough water. We know that plants wilt when they don't have enough water. Well, plants will wilt also when you give them too much water. It's a, it's a plant's natural reaction when it gets overwatered. And I think, uh, Lisa, what might be going on here is you might be, if you say you're watering it daily, you might be overwatering it a little bit. And so um, you might want to hold off and maybe, uh, maybe water it every other day or maybe other, uh, maybe uh, every three days or so. What you what you want to do is make sure the plant obviously is getting enough water so it can stay hydrated, stay beautiful, and not wilt. And um, but you also don't want it to be uh, you don't want it under drought conditions either. So something to look at um, when right before you water is take your finger, yeah, stick it in the pot and see if it's moisture. If there's any moisture down there, if you feel moisture down there, um, chances are you don't probably need to water. It depends on how deep too your pot, your pot is. So let's say- I was wondering say, if it was in a pot. Is it in a pot or in the ground? Well, in, uh, in so, so either way, either yeah, way. Yeah, that's true. So, but what you want to do is, uh, let's say this is your pot. Here's your beautiful plant right here. You know what? We have plants. We, we have plants. Let's, let's use the <laughs> real plant, Sean, come on. Okay, so plant in a pot. What you do is stick your finger, just literally stick your finger down in there. Don't worry about the roots. They're going to be fine. Don't worry about the plant. Um, just stick it down on the side of the pot like that and bring it back up. You want to go down maybe two or so inches if you can and depending on how big your finger is. Um, so I just stuck my finger down here. It's wet. It's definitely, there's moisture down there. I know that feeling that moisture on my finger, I don't need to water this plant right now. Now that could change by tomorrow depending on how fast the plant is going through the water, sucking it up and perspiring and transpiring and all this stuff. So just use your finger, stick it mm. down in there, check to see if there's moisture. If there is, don't water. Do it tomorrow. Wait until tomorrow to check again and see if there's moisture down there. And continually do that so you make sure that you don't overwater your plant. And uh, if you start doing this, I'm pretty sure your plant's not going to keep wilting. So uh, hopefully that helps. I hope so. Um, I know, because violas are so beautiful. They are. They're gorgeous. And so, but... Uh, if it keeps happening, even though you're, you know, you're not overwatering it, you're not watering it every day, and it still wilts and does these things, there it could be something else. But an easy fix is to just not water it so much. Yeah, that's a really good, really good advice. Hopefully that helps. Sometimes I think Dana Hoover said this best: we over, we like, we love our plants to death, right? Because we, we love them too much. We want, we love them too much. We want to take <laughs> care of them, and we keep watering them, we and do. we keep, we give them so much. We give attention. them too much attention. Sometimes. We do. So. So. Um, yeah, so thank you for all of awesome. those questions. Yep. Thank you guys for thank hanging on. I know we've been talking, um, doing some questions for yeah. a little while. Wow. Now. Oh, yeah. We so we want to talk about hummingbirds because mm. they are cool. Hummers. And, Hummers you know, are awesome. they're so beneficial for your garden. There's so many reasons yep. to attract them. Um, you may not even be wanting to attract them and they'll show up because you have certain types of plants or certain colors of flowers mm -hmm. or certain shapes. Mm -hmm. They're very attracted to different, um, different specific things. Yes. So this is going to be yep. fun. Yep. And, uh, Putting all those together, putting all the things we're going to present to you together in your garden is going to bring them and keep them in your garden. Now, what we're, so. yeah, definitely. We have a lot of um, hummingbirds. We have one that's here year round as a resident in our, um, the western part of, the, of Washington state. Mm -hmm. We have quite a few hummingbirds in our state, but only two mm -hmm. that actually we would see in this area. Yep. We have an Anna's hummingbird and a Rufus hummingbird. Mm -hmm. So Anna's hummingbirds are pretty common um, up and down the west coast. So they're, they're, they really some, they're the ones that you see that are green, but then they have like the red throat. The mm -hmm. males have kind of a so, red hood. And it's and bright. You'll notice it. They're You'll so see beautiful. It. Yeah. And it's so cool when they turn to a certain, you know, angle of the sun. They just like glow. Yeah. And, and it's so pretty. And, and hummingbirds, if you, if you really don't know, they literally, when they stop in midair, 
they're like hovering. It's so cool. It's like it's like sci-fi to me. It's like they're like little how can it do aircraft. that? It's little it's little wings are just going so fast like you, you can barely motion. even see them going. So and what's cool for me, um, some of you know, I t I took all the photographs for our book, and I love photography. I don't make enough time for it sometimes, but it's just one of those hobbies that's very relaxing to me. Yeah. I love taking pictures of nature and wildlife. So hummingbirds are very like. It, they're a challenge, and I really love that about them because they move so mm -hmm. fast. Mm -hmm. So it's very hard to get those those captures because they do. They are always on the go. Always, yep. And always. they just have funny behavior. So what we wanted to do is present um, some ideas for you guys in case you want to attract more hummingbirds with certain flowers. You know, it's kind of fun to think about a hummingbird garden. Maybe. It is. Oh yeah, totally is. Yeah. Which all, will also attract some other pollinators, so yeah. benefit there. Yep, yep. But there are some specific needs and some things you need to do to keep them health, healthy and safe so they will come back to your yard and they won't get sick. Yep. So a couple, just some, some things we are going to share with you. And we, um, we encourage you guys to like drop some ideas in the chat for all of us to consider. Yeah. Maybe there, you grow some plants in your yard that are just like havens for hummingbirds. Yeah, we what would do you love do? to hear. Yeah, what do you do to attract hummingbirds, if you do, to your garden? So should we move yeah, on start. with the slide here so we guys uh before we do this we're gonna try something new I with know. the technology so if there's a few hiccups bear with us i know sorry um, we so, thought this would be more yeah. interactive <laughs> with our low tech so here we go stuff. so here. testing here we go you guys ready okay here we go oh look, look, at, there we go. look at that ah, we did it it okay. did it worked <laughs> yay there's a lot going on on the screen, but we're still there. Yeah. So, so cool. um, okay, so these are kind of a list of best practices, and this is mm -hmm. actually based on the National Wildlife um, Foundation. They have, um, you can actually certify your own yard and a certain um, size of yard to be a, a wildlife habitat. Mm -hmm. We're yep. very proud to say that our backyard is a wildlife habitat. Yep. And then, and oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was going to say, the, the things up there you see one through five, those are the three things that you need to do to basically... Uh, have a certified wildlife habitat. Now, if you don't want to get certified, that's fine. But you and you can still, even if you're not certified, you can still do these you things. You can absolutely do and, these things. And you know, this will basically improve and attract so many different pollinators. Not, not just hummingbirds uh, alone, but butterflies and birds oh. and insects and I mean, just a lot of different things. And it's great for your garden because once you do these things, you're bringing these, uh, you're bringing wildlife in general in, and that helps your garden be healthy it's, because that's an interaction we don't think about it like this but in nature there's an interaction between the animals and mm -hmm. the plants and that's what keeps things natural in their natural cycles and um, that interaction is very helpful so if you can mimic that in your own garden your garden's going to be so much more healthy it really will and it's mm -hmm. just it's good practice you know just to be yep. to create that healthy ecosystem but yep. so basically breaking these down um so for hummingbirds specifically mm -hmm. so we're talking about food now okay how do you entice them with food you're you're thinking po sources of nectar and pollen mm -hmm. um and we're going to dive into that a little deeper on the next slide but there's different specific plants that they actually will like you know just flock to. And there's so many. There's so many. There's so many. Just what we're going to go over today is just the tip of the iceberg. Totally the tip of the iceberg. And, you know, the other thing is, is you might think, well, yeah, plants, but aren't there feeders? And yeah, there are. There so, are definite hummingbird yeah. feeders out there specifically made for the birds to come to to attract them. And so, yeah, what you're going to do is make a solution of um, sugar and water, mm -hmm. and it basically just mimics nectar that they'd find in the wild. Mm -hmm. Now, hummingbirds are very attracted to the color red, and a lot mm -hmm. of flowers they feed from are red. Yep. So, by if you notice, if maybe you you already knew this, but most feeders for hummingbirds are red. Mm -hmm. So it's meant to attract them, and then you fill it with clean sugar water. The key is to keep that feeder clean, yep. because they do they kind of tend to get like kind of moldy. If you leave them too long, they will get kind of yucky inside, and it yep. can make them sick. Yep. So that would be the last thing we'd all want to do, right? Mm -hmm. So we usually, we clean our feeders every time we change the water out. Mm -hmm. And I know some people I've read, um, they'll, they'll have multiple feeders and they just keep them on a rotation. So mm -hmm. like they'll pull the dirty one, put the new one back up. That's a great idea. Yeah, you have That's like great extras system. almost. Yeah. yeah, and think about this way, guys. If you, um, if you have anything sugary out there, or maybe I should back up. If, if you've ever done anything like Petri dishes with some type of uh, gel or auger or whatever, whatever you've called it, there's usually some sucrose in there. There's usually a base of sugar somewhere in there, and that helps grow different things like mold and fungus, and you can do tissue culture and all yeah. that. It's the same premise with the sugar water. 
it basically it, 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 it it's a great growth medium yeah it really is it doesn't mean to be it, it just is natural quick. so mm. yeah think about it maybe in that term so just keep things. your yeah just feed your or clean in um we we have these cool little brushes we got on amazon and maybe we can link those if you guys are interested yeah. there I, I bought some for my mom too because she has little feeders they are just these little tiny brushes they almost look like a dental instrument kind of like they're just these <laughs> tiny things and they're meant to get the little holes that they feed out of they, they look almost surgical they're they're tiny they do. They're and they're great. really cheap on amazon so maybe we'll we'll throw those up a little later but um yeah so keeping the feeders clean um what we're experiencing in our yard right now is that the hum hummers have seemed to kind of disappeared because they're all nesting right now so we've noticed mm. that we had just we've had hummers all year and all of a sudden we haven't seen them very much yeah Kind of looks like the water level's going mm -hmm. down, but then we haven't mm -hmm. seen them. Yeah. So we think that they're feeding and nesting. Nesting, and yeah. actually, you know, there's so much in bloom right now, so yeah. they're busy. So, yeah, we've been wondering. We got a little, a uh, little worried there. I a did. Days. I know. Yeah, we really did. And so, yeah, but yeah, thinking about it, yeah, everything's okay. Logically, it's, maybe it seen, makes sense. Yeah, and maybe you've seen the same thing. Yeah. You've noticed the same thing. So. Um, so we've got some great pictures up here on the screen though too of actual hummingbirds literally feeding. The one on the left is from, uh, it's, it's, that bird right there is feeding on an actual flower. And it's coming from the top, a little bit of an angle, but it comes in and it uses that long beak. And it's got, if you've ever noticed, um, hummingbirds have a really long tongue too. Mm -hmm. You just, you don't think about it, it's like a bird has a tongue. Yeah, they do. <laughs> and so it comes out of that it comes out of that long beak. So that's what it uses to get the nectar. Well, it makes sense to think about, and we're gonna talk about this in a minute, but um, they they tend to um, flock towards like trumpet shaped yeah. or tubular shaped flowers. And you can see that in these pictures here. Well that one and then the other one is um, an actual hummingbird feeder. feeder. Yeah. And you can see it's got that that type of shape. It's not a trumpet, but it is kind of tubular and it has it lets the hummingbird naturally use its beak. To go in and get its tongue out there and get that sugar water. It's so fun to watch too, mm -hmm. you guys. It's just and they're so funny to watch in the yard. Maybe you have some and you already know this, but mm -hmm. they're very territorial. <laughs> oh, yeah. So one recommendation <laughs> is, and this is something we're working on this year, is to mm -hmm. actually have feeders spread out more and maybe yeah. almost a little bit hidden from each other. Yeah, maybe kitty corner from each like, other so they can be the furthest like, away. Yeah, like across the yard from each other, but always yeah. under shelter. Yes. You never want to hang the and you probably know this, but don't ever hang bird feeders or um, hummingbird feeders out out in the wide open yep. because they are just asking for being attacked. Well, the, and the birds will only come to those feeders if they're in the wide open, if they're super, um, if, if they have no other alternative to, um, to find other food, if they're really, really hurting for food, they'll go out because they know they're fully exposed to hawks and really? eagles and ospreys mm, and all sorts all of different of predators. So, Sad. We've been having yeah. some hawks in our yard again. And we gotta run them off. It makes off. us feel <laughs> awful because we're, we're trying to help and feed the birds, but then we're attracting the prey. Yep. Or and the, that's, yeah. And think about it this way: if you have a, if you attract a lot of birds, you're also, you're, you're also becoming part of that ecosystem, and part of that ecosystem is the prey for those birds. So they are going to show up eventually. I know. So if you haven't already thought about it, maybe try and have a plan of what to do when that happens oh. and they show up. We we basically go out the door and run them off. <laughs> we it's have like to. ridiculous, but we do. It's just yep. we just we feel very protective of our hummer, hummers and our birds, and yep. it's it's like yeah. the circle of life, right? It, it is. It's we, the wild we try to help, sometimes. and the hawks keep coming back. They're not yeah. going to not come here, yep. but we have a lot of birds. Let's put it yeah, that way. So, so anyway, moving on. So moving on. Um, we we didn't really cover just out loud. Um, definitely oh. hummers and any birds as well. Like areas for shelter. So that means trees or shrubs or anywhere. Hummers actually nest, which is the next one. Places for, they nest everywhere. Their nests are tiny. Mm -hmm. If you guys have ever seen they, a hummingbird nest, nest, sorry, I can't talk. They are absolutely teeny tiny. So they can nest pretty much anywhere. So as long as you have cover, often it could be, again, like in shrubs or trees or. Mm -hmm. um, there we go. Oh, here's our next slide. Here's okay. our next slide. Sorry guys, I'm resizing as we're talking. Oh, there here. we go. See, I didn't even know we were doing that. So thinking about more best practices for hummers, um, think about colors. So we already mentioned red. They okay. are very attracted to the color red. Um, oranges, purples. Oh yeah. So flowers yep. that come in any of those colors are yep. gonna just be a magnet. Super bright, yeah, they, they love that. And so, and as Allison already said, you know, look for your, uh, the, the flower shape, trumpet shaped, tubular shaped, something with a long, 
almost like a neck, like a flower with a long neck and then the, uh, the petals come out and something where uh, the hummingbird's literally gonna have to stick its beak almost all the way in or, or into that neck or that trumpet to get to the nectar and to get to uh, the pollen further in on that, uh, that flower. They love that yeah. and that attracts them. So and it, it, because they can, right? They yeah. have that long it's, it's beak. It's natural for them. They're just like, oh yeah, that's easy. Like it's kind of like a couple examples real quick. Um, think of your salvia plants, you know, the flowers yeah. and the salvia. Like our hot lip salvia is a huge magnet for hummingbirds. In fact, yeah. it was in our book. We took a picture of oh, a hummingbird yeah. Yeah, definitely. floating around. Yeah, no, definitely. It was, that was fun to watch. And um, think of like fuchsias. fuchsias. They love hang, fuchsias. Hang basket fuchsias or regular fuchsias, like in ground fuchsias. Yeah. They love that, those those flowers, uh, the way they're shaped, and there's so many too. So they, they'll they flock to those plants because they can literally go from bloom to bloom to bloom in seconds. And they'll go over the whole plant in like maybe like maybe a minute if it's got a lot so of blooms. They can look. just zip, 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 and they move so fast. You can see why it's so hard to get photos of them. Uh, they don't stand still very long. <laughs> they, you know, they go after different um, flowering shrubs that I wouldn't mm. have even thought they'd go after. Like I, oh. I've caught them several times this year going after our laurel, which our laurel's in bloom right now. Yep. And I had no idea that they would go after the laurel flowers. It's an English laurel. It gets really yeah. big. It's got beautiful white flowers. Really so tall, again, spiky. talk about colors. Yeah. White, white, yeah, white that's flowers. Interesting. It's in our yard. It's a food source. They love the that's flower fun. shape. Boom, they go in and they get it. I know, it. that's so cool. Yep. So, okay, should we show these really quick? Sure, yeah. So, you guys, I'm, we're I'm super off. excited about this plant. I don't know. Oh, maybe we should make this full screen. We're going to make this full screen, folks. Because this is just, this deserves a full screen shot here. This is a new plant um, that we're trying this year from Proving Winners, there but I mean, they've I mean, other people okay. sell it as well. But this is a firecracker plant or a ver vermilionaire. vermilionaire. So basically, we had a couple blooms in already, and I'm not seeing them. So we might need to show the tag. There isn't much to see. Um, but it's got this cool, like, long, I don't know if you guys can see that. I guess it'd be more fun if this was in bloom. But it looks like a firecracker almost. Yeah, they, they literally look like thin firecrackers, like zebras or something else that you might have shot off when you were a kid. And... <laughs> They've, uh, they're just that bright red, thin, thin necked, very That's long, beautiful plants. I'm so excited yep. to grow this this year. Yep. And now guys, just to give you some uh, culture information, full sun and this one particularly will get 18 to 28 inches tall. Wow, so I forgot it's about that. Tall. How far does it spread? Um, it doesn't say so far. Um, uh, do, 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 spacing. So it talks about spacing. It doesn't talk about how wide it gets, but it talks about spacing. So when you're looking at these tags and it doesn't talk about the space, like, I'm oh, sorry, it doesn't talk about how wide it gets, look at the spacing numbers and that'll give you an idea of how big it's going to get. So this says spacing minimum of 12 inches, maximum of 18 inches. Awesome. So it's probably going to get up to about a foot and a half. Yeah, about a foot and a half wide. Oh, that's so and cool. And a foot and a half, to, a little over two feet tall. So, do so. You, any of you guys grow this? Um, we'd love to hear. Um, we're going to put it in a container this year. Yeah, beautiful. Just to start plant. with, and then we'll probably move yeah. it into our landscape the following year because it yeah. is a perennial for us. So, you can find this, as you probably already noticed, you can find this at Proven Winners. So excited. Uh -huh, provenwinners.com. And so, a little bit more information um, it's an annual except in zones 8 through 11. So, that's cool. It possibly could be a perennial it's, here. I'm considering in it. Our, I mean, it's, it's zoned for a perennial here in our, yeah. in our zone. So, that's cool. Um, That's so always a good thing. So water it normally, regular no water normal, uh, normal watering, full sun, and it's heat tolerant, it's drought tolerant. I mean, this is a beautiful, this is gonna awesome, be awesome plant. I can't wait to see this thing just with yeah. all these firecracker looking plants or flowers. Yeah. It's, it's, so it's just stay tuned, you guys. Gorgeous. We'll definitely be showing you this one on video. So, right? and yeah, and so something else, bonus, it blooms basically uh, once it, once you plant it and starts blooming. Like right now, if we planted it now, it's supposedly supposed to bloom all the way until the autumn, until the first frost. Oh, cool. That's Continual awesome. flowering. That, that is awesome. That's super cool. So that's a fun one. Yeah. Okay. So the firecracker plant. Firecracker plant. So, um, yeah, we've got this one. I know a couple of you are, mm. were spotting this. I am super excited about this one. This is Super Bell's Watermelon Punch. And we're actually planting these. We have four Calibro of these. Kid, this is a Calibro yeah, kid. Calibro yep. kid. We're planting these in a blue container, so we'll show you that when we get that all Let me set just up. Get that up there. But look at that color. Oh. Look at that, you guys. You Isn't guys. that beautiful? Now, Calabroca wow. is a hummingbird attractor. So if you look in the kind of the center of the flower, you, you can see how it's kind of a little bit of a trumpet or a tubular. How mm -hmm. would you describe that? It's a, it's a, yeah, it's like a trumpet. 
Um, maybe, you know, I'd, I'd dare to say a tuba. Tuba? Really? <laughs> a tuba shape. That's a new it's one. It's not a trumpet, it's a tuba. <laughs> it's a beautiful tuba shaped flower, apparently. <laughs> I love that. But yeah, um, yeah. yeah, isn't that beautiful? It's got okay. like this dark center and kind of that pinkish um, magenta mm -hmm. kind of around the middle. It's got there. those delicate little leaves. And uh, it, I love that. You know, you guys might not know this, but this is a cousin of uh, petunias. They're yeah. actually cousins in the plant world. And, and the hummingbirds so, love petunias as well. Yep. So any of the, you know, you probably grow a lot of this already and forgot that, oh yeah, these like hummingbirds love this stuff. Mm -hmm. So, um, oh, and this guy, we, we went over the, some of the culture information for the other one. Maybe this one would be a good one, too. Okay, while you do that, so, I'm going to fix our camera. Just okay, a second, fixing camera, because we're out of focus. We are fuzzy. We're not focused yet, so... Ah, go. So, really quick, guys. Uh, the Calabroca will take a full to part sun. Um, it'll get 6 to 12 inches tall. It's more of a spreader instead of growing up. It's more of a spreading plant, which we like. And I think Allison has a plan for this to go in one of our... <laughs> I do. I just mentioned the blue pots. The blue pots. It's going to be so pretty. Yes. Yes. We yes. love blue. So, yes. So, uh, yeah, mounting trailing plants, um, spacing up to 12 inches. So, it's going to it's gonna spread 12 Good. inches on center. That's cool. Oh, six that's inches cool. this way, six inches that way. Um, yeah, normal watering. Uh, yeah, no uh, deadheading not necessary. So, that's super that's cool. That's always nice. So, yeah. So, anyway, just a little bit of info on that's that guy. That's always fun. So before we go on to our next slide, we've got a whole bunch of plants and flowers to um, mm. recommend and maybe talk about with you guys. Mm -hmm. We've got some stuff going on in the chat. We haven't, oh. we've been kind of focused on these. So yeah. wanted to say good morning to Sharon LeFay. Oh, uh, you good jumped morning, in Sharon. a while ago. Yeah. I'm sorry we haven't said hello yet. Um, Thanks for being here. Sharon mentioned that she planted a pyrus. Oh, I always say pyrus. Mm -hmm. Pyrus yesterday. Pyrus. Sweet. Um, but it, she said, unfortunately, it's done flowering, but she's still really excited for that. Ooh. And then um, there was a question about what color the blooms were, and it sounds like they were white. Let me check yeah, what I read here. That's pretty common for that's a pyrus. White. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that grows here, and we they are beautiful. It'd be interesting. Does it have the variegated leaf with that uh, okay. off green or even yellow or white uh, variegation on it, that color on each leaf, or is it more just straight up green? So, Good question. Yeah. I mean, they come in those different forms, so those varieties. So, okay. but cool. Yeah, pyrus really cool. Yeah. Um, oh, Jay Harrison, there's a question. Um, oh. They asked, um, asked us, do we have more than one feeder and are we going to add more to what we have? We always want to add we more. Want, we have two <laughs> right now designated hummingbird feeders and yeah. they're two different shapes. Yeah. So we have that typical tall, you know, kind of tubular shape that has the little, you know, the little perch around the bottom, mm -hmm. you know. Um, we have that style and we also have a round flat disc shaped one mm -hmm. that um, just kind of, it's, Probably profile is only about this tall. It's super thin. It looks like a disc. It looks, it like, a looks disc. like a disc. And they, we kind of thought they'd like that one more, but they actually prefer the tube one. I think it's because they're used to that one. I think so too. And on the tube, the tube taller one, it has little uh, plastic flower heads. It mimics little flower heads around yeah. it. So they look. They actually, the hummingbird could get the perception that it's going into individual flowers on this uh, this feeder. It's pretty cool. That's, that's cool. And the, the answer is yes, we do want to add more feeders. Oh, yeah. We want to spread them around a little better. Yep. Right now we have them hanging on opposite ends of like our back kind of above our, our on our deck, mm -hmm. but under cover. Under our, uh, yeah. Under, under our eave. Yeah, under our eave. Yeah. But um, we want to, I'd like to put a couple maybe out in the yard in mm -hmm. protected That'd spots. And that's you know, great. you can get those, um, those stands you know that you can either put in the ground and they have the little hooks on them or mm -hmm. just put them in a tree or something i want to get a i'd like to get at least two more i think okay. sounds like we got a plan guys hey <laughs> spread them out hide them <laughs> cool so that's a great question it do you is. do you guys have feeders in your yard as oh, well yeah. we'd love to hear yeah, from you do, guys do any of you guys yeah. help feed the uh the hummingbirds in your yard oh and, it looks like and what do you use yeah totally okay. sorry it looks okay. like sherry okay. mentioned she has four feeders so two in the front yard mm. and two in the back that's a great idea the awesome. problem is the bees. They're attacking the feeders and running um, the few wow. hummingbirds we have away. Isn't that interesting? That's interesting. Any suggestions to deter the bees? See, we don't have that problem here, luckily. Maybe it's a heat thing. It could be. It depends on where they're at, because if it's really... That's weird. If there's any residual heat in those areas, the bees... Well, I guess all, all animals like that residual heat because it makes them feel good. But bees especially, they like warm areas. They don't like cool areas. So we've noticed out in our front yard where there's a lot of uh, stone and rock, yeah. it takes on a lot of heat over the day. It, it, it takes it in and then it, it, um, it puts it back out there in the nighttime. Well, once that heat builds up in there, we've seen a lot more bee activity out there uh, during the day than we have in our front yard. I mean, in our backyard. So um, that could be something. But also... Uh, 
the number of flowering plants you have during this time of year or the time of year that the bees are kind of taking over that um, that feeder, that might be influencing them going to that feeder. Hmm. So hmm. If, if you don't have a lot of plants flowering during that time of year, that's probably one of their main sources of food then. But if you have more flowers in your yard during that time of year, they might leave that alone. They could leave that alone. It'd be interesting to find out if you could increase your flower. Well, numbers. and I think it's Sherry. I think Sherry has a lot of stuff planted from what we've oh, maybe okay. heard. Um, lots of things that you've been adding. Yeah. I'm wondering if they're going um, after the water. I mean, they're probably attracted to the sugar too, right? Totally. That was my thought is they're attracted to the sugar. But it could be the water. Totally. I wonder if, um, it could be. I think Delphina yeah. offered a suggestion, and I'm oh. kind of wondering as well, like maybe a bee or butterfly little puddler or oh. some kind of little. It's um, a great idea. Yeah. You know, you can make the, we made one. Yeah, we did. We made a we butterfly did. little water station. Um, actually, the birds took it over. <laughs> the birds took it over. <laughs> so we turned it into a bird uh, bath. But yeah, um, hey, yeah. we tried. We tried. We have so many birds, you guys. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's an interesting, I don't know. We've seen maybe bees hovering around our Hummer feeders like later in the summer here. Mm -hmm. It'd be like yellow jackets, like the nasty, you know. When they get aggressive. When they get aggressive. Yeah. Well, in something too, Sherry, um, that's happening is, uh, or Sherry. 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 Sorry. Uh, you could have a, a hive or a nest really close oh, by, that's a good point. and it might just be convenience for the bees. Interesting. It, just, it could yeah, just be a convenient totally. thing where they're like, hey, there's a food source. It's not far from home. Let's go feed and bring it back, you know? So, that's interesting. I know. Be. I wish we could help more with that. I don't know if it would be worth trying to move them around to a different spot. Yeah, move your feeder. And maybe just kind of see how that works yep. for a while, and maybe, yep. is it, did you, let me look at your comment. Did, was, were the bees attacking both front and backyard feeders? So maybe mm -hmm. if that's the case, mm -hmm. yeah, maybe try moving them. Or if it's just one location, maybe kind of move them all to the other location. Yeah. I don't know. Interesting. Keep us yeah. posted. Or let them feed because you're helping the local environment. So but they are if, chasing the Hummer. But it, yeah, it if, it's like, if it's really impacting the Hummers, yeah. Allison's suggestion just to move them, probably a good idea. It's like us with the hawks. Like, get out of the yard. You're not welcome. <laughs> you, leave, you leave our birds alone. <laughs> yeah. Oh so, my goodness, yeah, you guys. That's, yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, let us know how that goes. I know, please do. Let's see. Okay, um, Rosie has seven seven feeders, I'm assuming oh you mean. Oh my gosh, and, um, cool. Yeah, two cups of water to one cup of sugar. Oh, wow. wow. And there's so many hummers. Okay. okay. Yeah. Uh, it's usually four to one ratio, and that's you called yourself out on that next. Yeah. So um, usually four parts water to one part sugar. sugar. Yep. It's, a, it's so easy to make. One thing that's really sad, and I think you guys probably already know this, but I think the general public maybe doesn't realize that that red solution that they sell at like Home Depot or whatever that's supposed to be Hummer food, mm -hmm. that's actually really unhealthy for There's them. There's a lot of articles out there on it that, really that, that call it out and say it's not a healthy source for them. So, Makes I mean, sense. do your own research. Yes, definitely. Do and if you research, use it, you know, I don't want to be like, you know, shame on you, but... It's really, yeah. it has like dyes and stuff in it that isn't actually very good for them. Yeah. And it's so easy just to boil sugar water. Yeah, it takes 10 minutes. It's like super easy. Yep, yep. But, but again, we, yeah, we, we don't want to. Yeah, and we get the convenience of yeah, it. Grab it off the shelf, bring it home, throw it in the feeder, you're done. Totally. So yeah, yeah no judgment. Do be mindful no judgment. that that might not be good for yeah. your hummers. Um, let's see. Kim Matlock, for the past few years, we've had two outside our kitchen window, the two mm. feeders. That's cool. Cool, that's um, what we do. Last uh, year, I think they really fed off them a lot, and we really enjoyed watching them. They're, they are oh, so beautiful and oh, amazing to watch. They're amazing creatures. And it's so fun. That's how we have ours arranged. They're, like, right in front of our windows, but protected, yeah. you know, from, out, you know, they're undercover for them, mm -hmm. but they're, like, visible to us. Mm -hmm. Predators can't see it. We've made sure that the predators, Very like, from safe. up above, because they'll, you know, they, they move around up, and they try to look, and then they dive bomb and grab the little birds. So where we have them, that's not possible for the predators. Yeah, so yeah. that's good. So. But it is funny. They their little personalities will be maybe looking <laughs> yeah. out the back window, for example, and they will hover right in front of us, and we'll realize, oh, our feeders are low. I mean, they're they're like telling us we, we think maybe yeah. not. Or they got a little attitude and they're like, what? What I know, are you they, doing? They kind of get in front of us in the window sometimes. They're just they're hilarious. And when we're outside, they'll literally if we get too close to the feeders, they buzz us. They they literally do a flyby buzz around our heads to make sure that we know that's their feeder and we shouldn't mess with it. I know, that's hilarious. It's crazy. <laughs> Reminds me of Top Gun doing a flyby. All I, right, I moving think. on. <laughs> Let's show them the plants. Okay, we have one okay. more slide to show you, oh, you guys. One more Sorry, slide. we're kind Sorry, of rambling. Guys. We're ramblers. Um, yeah, so we wanted to give you just a quick list of some ideas. Um, we've got a, a lot of different plants and flowers here arranged by season. 
So we're going to show you a list for spring, summer, and fall. Yeah, look at all those. And the cool thing is a lot of these overlap. So like fuchsias could go from spring through fall, right? Mm -hmm. um, often some of your, I mean, there's other plants that could be at least summer, fall. So you, mm -hmm. you, you, there's a lot of overlap here. Yeah, there is. There's a lot. Yeah, like um, definitely, you know, the fuchsias. But forsythia, they're great for the oh, early spring. You know, but then they, they stop flowering and then that food source is gone. But then again, if you have other plants that uh, progress with flowering all the way through spring, summer, and into fall, you're good to go for food sources to keep those hummingbirds there. That reminds so. me of our hot lip salvia again. Our, our mm -hmm. You know, it'll start blooming in the summer. It blooms all the way through fall, and it just yep. produces so much nectar. Yep. And so, so does, cool. you know, in the agastache, that's another one. Oh, it true. it yeah. starts that Texas hummingbird mint. I know. It literally is called a hummingbird mint plant. And... Um, it blooms just like the the salvia, the hot lip salvia. It blooms continuously. And last year we brought um, a couple of uh, agastache into our yard in our backyard. The hummingbirds, they they just flew around it all the time. Oh, they they just, love it. They were there every day, you know, for the new flowers, check in for new flowers, new nectar. I mean, they just yeah, they really enjoyed that. Plus, it smells amazing oh, because yeah. it is in the mint family, yep, and yep. it's just a oh, it's just an amazing and smell. It, and it's not a, an aggressive. A plant mm. like a regular mint plant would be this this mint plant does not spread it doesn't take over gardens um, it's a great mint plant to have it is so we highly recommend yep, yep. but then you've got like I mean we could have added zinnias to the summer list as well and mm -hmm. into fall because mm -hmm. zinnias believe it or not do attract some hummingbirds they like it um, they do like the shapes of like nephophia or mm -hmm. leatris or even your delphinium crocosmia mm -hmm. crocosmia is a huge hummingbird attractor yep. and again that longish neck some type of longish tubular trombone type of neck <laughs> uh, they, they love that that really that really attracts them so so lots of things here, you guys. Um, moving mm -hmm. into the fall, you've got your asters, which often can provide some late fall, you know, um, food sources. Mm -hmm. Dianthus might be in bloom again. Mm -hmm. um, gladiolus. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, definitely the glads. Yeah. They definitely have that uh, that tubular shape to their flower. Yeah, and, and uh, oddly enough, phlox, which you might think, well, maybe that you know that's more of a flat type of flower, it's kind isn't of flat. it? Yeah. It's it's flattish on the top, but then it does have a long kind of neck. It's um, in that way, it's kind of similar to a petunia flower, where it looks like it's flat on top, but then you get closer and you can see it does go a little bit down below with a tube shape or um, trumpet shape type of uh, neck down to where that nectar is. So, so yeah. lots of ideas, you guys. Um, are you growing some things on this list as well? Or I mean, like Sean mentioned earlier, this is by no means mm -hmm. the only, or by no means an exhaustive, yeah, list. I mean, there's so many more plants. So it's just fun to experiment. Um, a lot of you are growing different types of new flowers this year, so it'll be fun for you probably to see oh, yeah. like what what will work, what will they like. Yeah. Again, think of colors of reds and purples and oranges, and mm -hmm. I mean, pretty much any tubular type shaped plants, no matter what color, oh, yeah. they'll go after, but they'll, they're gonna tend to those brighter colors probably first. Oh yeah, definitely. And also pink, watch, yeah. yeah, also watch when you put any of these plants in your yard or the new plants that you have, like like Kim, I keep coming back to you in my mind with all your zinnias. Oh, I know, ah! we've got a picture of that. And yeah. so um, watch not only for the hummingbirds, watch for the other pollinators, the other birds and insects and different critters out there, they're gonna come to those plants too. Um, and come to those flowers. I mean, it's it's amazing. Once you put it out there, they do come. So I know. It, it's great. And hopefully, Sherry, they will leave your feeder. The bees will leave your feeders alone and move mm. away. She she did chime in and said um, she has lots of flowering plants, and they Good. okay. She has tried moving them around, and it's oh, been okay. really warm in California. So I don't okay. know. Maybe it's just kind of a weird. Maybe it's a heat thing. Like, is this a new yeah. thing this year? Is another question I have. Yeah. Is have this you like, seen this behavior before? Yeah, with the bees. So. Yeah. So we um, so, we're gonna move on. We've got um, a couple of you sent in some photos. Um, Dana Hoover had a great idea last week to share with mm -hmm. all of us about I know. that's so cool, which is so fun. And we want to invite you to continue doing this. Um, send your photos in so we can highlight them and talk about yep. them with everybody. What's going on in yeah. your gardens? What's blooming? What's growing? What projects? Yeah, you might new be projects here that you're going through. Yeah, we want to know. We want to know. And if you're okay with it, we want to showcase it on on our live. I'm with, excited with you to show it. So yeah. So okay. Okay. Enough. Get in there. So, Kim, okay. we've got a couple of your photos you sent. So, here we go. Yay. Yay! So, we had, um, so Dana sent in her pole beans, which she actually won um, from a previous giveaway, I think, that we had in March. Oh, that was our seed giveaway. With the little dibby. With the little dibby. Our little dibby yes. uh, garden tool for seed planting. 
So she was really excited and mentioned in her email that um, she's never grown these before and has ha is having a lot of fun watching them and, grow. And so look far. at that picture, you guys. Dana, you're doing a great job. This they look all awesome. look healthy, robust. And it's funny, pole beans and uh, maybe just beans in general, when they pop up out of the ground, they're just like, they just look strong. They just look like they're just like, just hey, we're here, we're ready, let's go, you know? And, and look at that. I they know, do. They just pop right out of the ground. Wow. Oh, pole be having fresh beans in your yard, as some of you probably mm -hmm. know, it's like the best. It, it is. is so oh, good. Yeah. Go oh, harvest them, clean them, and throw them in a frying just pan throw, with butter. Yeah. Oh, mm. gosh, that sounds so good. And so onions. We need to, I don't think we've started our own pole beans. Uh oh. Dana, you're, you're inspiring us, us to, to do our pole we beans. We need to do that. Yeah. So we've got a couple beautiful pictures from Kim. Kim, thank you for sending these. We love seeing Look your at gardens. All those. That's I know. Beautiful. So the wow. and the middle picture was um, her moon garden that mm -hmm. she said she's still growing and expanding. But mm -hmm. look at that beauty. Gorgeous, and it looks like there might be a rhodia in there too, behind on the on the right side. Oh, that's so and then cool. Are, are those petunias or those impatience with the white flowers? Maybe. Kim, if you're still here, let us know. Yeah, we want to know what we you got in there. Know. That's beautiful. And Love then um, zinnias that she grew from her seed zinnias. for the first time last year. And Love she zinnias. said she has now become a zinnia addict. Yes. You joined, growing, joined the club. Joined the club. <laughs> she is now growing, I think it was over 20 or 22 different types of zinnias this wow, year. Wow. That is awesome, Kim. So are Look you at that. So Kim, are you spreading them all over your yard, or do you have a designated like zinnia bed? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, we'd love to hear. Yeah, and look at that, you guys. You know, and this is just you know th these are um, these are great photos. We want to see more of these. Oh, Let us so know fun. what's going on in your yard. I this know. is so cool, and we wanna we wanna showcase you guys and all the great stuff you're doing. Send us pictures. So. Um, if you feel comfortable doing so, um, send any of your photos to yeah. Sean and Allison at SpokenGarden.com. Yeah. And let us know what's going on in the photo so we can kind of talk about it a little bit with yeah, you guys. Totally great idea. Yeah. So thank nice. you for sending those. That was so a really awesome. fun start to that. We'd love to do that every week if we can. <laughs> we would. Yep. So. so we've got a little photo slide of our own just real quick. We're kind of obsessed with our flowering um, trees all over our yard. Yeah, the unspoken heroes oh, of landscapes. Oh, so beautiful. Your trees, you know, we don't, we don't really think about it. I mean, it, sometimes we forget about them because we never usually look up. We're always looking down or straight ahead or something for different, different plants and things going on in our garden. But if we look up, you're going to find beautiful trees with all of these amazing flowers and color. Well, and they don't last very long, so it's like mm -hmm. you got to kind of enjoy them for the week that they're, or mm -hmm. a couple weeks they're in bloom. We have uh, basically all, let's see, the first two photos at the top there on the left and the middle are both different types of cherry trees we have in our yard. Mm -hmm. There's a Mount Fuji on the left, the fruiting cherry tree we have in our yards in the middle there, mm -hmm. and then on the far right you'll see our flowering ornamental crab apple. Oh, beautiful. Yep. Yep. And then guys on the on the lower part there on the lower left there, that's our flowering cherry in the front it's yard. So gorgeous. And so I wanna to we well we wanna tell you guys, pretty much all these plants you see in the yard except or in this picture besides the, the potted plant there in the uh, in the middle, all the other trees right here that you're seeing or, or flowers you're seeing here, they were all planted by Allison's grandparents. They were. So these are all literally grandfathered into our garden and they're still gorgeous and beautiful and we're retraining some some of them yeah, and we're getting we, them a little bit healthier than they've been in the past and you can see it's helping it's 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 doing what we wanted to do they're doing what we wanted to do is just become healthy and beautiful and they look amazing i love that you mentioned that because it's just amazing to look at these plants and think these are well over 50 years old yeah they're older than us i mean they are old established trees and shrubs and the bottom right there is um, one of the azaleas that's popping azalea. in the bloom yeah bright hot pink i don't think that picture does it justice it doesn't but really it's like it's but amazing to think of a, a, a plant that will bloom for over 50 years yeah and yeah continue its growth it's as amazing. long as it's kept healthy and the right growing conditions it'll it'll just keep going these are beautiful plants so, so we're, we're a little obsessed with those right now a little but bit. just enjoying them you know <laughs> taking it all in enjoying the spring yeah so, so yeah if you guys can those are uh, most of those uh, uh, pictures are trees, and so if you can, maybe today or in the next couple of days, uh, take a moment to look up and see um, see if you can find any flowering trees around your yard or in your parks or on your walks or anything because it, it's just it's so amazing to see these things, these beautiful uh, plants and trees, and we kind of don't think about them. I know they're kind of out of sight, out of mind because we don't look up a lot. 
It, so. it's, it remind, yeah. It, we're also um, focused on the tulips and the daffodils oh, and all yeah. the beautiful things blooming oh, yeah. on the ground. So sometimes you forget, yeah. yeah. There's beautiful color going on around you. Yep. And just look up. I know. I love, I love the blooming cherry and plum trees this time of year. Oh, Some yeah. of them have already come and gone, but they're just so gorgeous. Yeah. The apple trees. Oh, oh. Yeah. Yep. There's even flowering beautiful. camellia trees right now. Uh, certain oh. species will, you know, you'll see the camellia trees blooming right now. And that's beautiful too. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Really fun. So, boom, boom. All right, you guys. Um, yeah, it's been, I hope <clears throat> that, um, <clears throat> I think we're kind of going to wrap this up yeah, a little we're, bit. We're, you guys we're have over been, 10 thank you ah! for, for hanging on and being here with us. Please send us your photos. Oh, We'd yeah. love to see a section, like we said, of your garden. Yeah, we want to know what's going on. We'd love to know what's going on. Oh. Um, we need to mention with you guys, too, though, our book, it, where we already did, it's, um, but real quick, it's being released this coming Tuesday. Tuesday the 27th. Tuesday the 27th. Now, if you pre-ordered our book already, which, thank you, thank you. by the way, you've done that. We really appreciate that. If you pre-ordered it, you need to send us a copy of your uh, purchase or a screenshot of the delivery or anything like that because there's once you pre-order a book, you get two freebies. You get two free pieces of content that we've created to say thank you for pre-ordering our book. And we're going to show you those right now on the screen. So one of those is an actual 60-plus page uh -oh. Uh, book. Oh, so I guess they're not on here. But basically... Um, uh, let me get this off the screen here. Okay, so um, we don't have that for you. Sorry, guys. Right now, maybe we'll have it here in a minute. But um, one of the freebies is uh, it's a 60-plus page book about spring-planted bulbs that flower during the summer. And we cover 21 amazing spring-planted bulbs that you can plant right now, basically. And it goes through some of their cultural information, how to use them, the different colors available, and sources to actually find them. And so this is something that we want to say thank you with for pre-ordering our oh, book. I know. I love that. Um, we love spring bulbs. We actually just filmed a behind the scenes video that we're going to be posting on a new membership oh, site yeah. that we're starting up. Um, well, it's membership for YouTube. For you for you guys. Yeah. yeah. And it's, um, so. it's going to be some bonus content and some things that we can do to kind of dive in a little deeper with you guys, like answering questions or doing specific videos to show mm -hmm. you how to do something. Mm -hmm. So we thought that would be kind of fun to try out. Mm -hmm. And we have a video, we just did inventory. Of, what did Excuse we me. count up? Almost 300 spring bulbs Crazy. that we're planting. Crazy. We didn't even start planning them yet, I you know. guys. We gotta do that. We need to do that. Ugh. So um, that's kind of fun. That made me think of the all the spring list. bulbs because there's just so many, so many beautiful things. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Okay, we've got a, got a little list of, yeah. little to-do list for me. things to do. I know. But also with uh, pre-ordering book, yeah, again, get that pre-order uh, purchase, proof of purchase, or the delivery screenshot or anything like that to us because not only do you get the 21 um, Spring Planted Bulbs uh, guidebook for free, you also are going to get access to our Dig Deeper series online uh, resource. Mm -hmm. It's a whole web page. Uh, it's a whole area of our web, play, uh, web pages that's available to you because you bought the book, you pre-ordered the book, and it dives deeper into... Um, each chapter has a dive deeper area in one about one subject that we go into a lot more detail with to help you in your garden to understand that concept and then so you can apply it right away yeah. and so that's something else that is um, we want to make available to you so um, definitely send us by email Sean and Allison at Spoken Garden uh, email us your proof of purchase screenshot of proof of purchase or even uh, a delivery, you know, online. If you did it with Amazon or wherever, whoever you did it with, get a screenshot of your delivery um, anticipation. You know when it's going to be delivered, and that'll let us know that you pre-ordered the book, and we can get you those freebies. We'll send it to you by email. Yeah, so. definitely. We'll get that to you as soon as possible. Some so. of you already have, and thank you for yeah, doing that. Let we us know. Get we want to get this to you because it's yeah. fun info, and um, it's very timely right now because of the spring bulb planting going on. Because mm -hmm. I mean, people are planting planting spring bulbs now all the way up through June, possibly. Right. Yeah. Oh, totally. So, oh, yeah. I mean, we will be. Oh, yeah, we will be. Because we're a little behind. <laughs> but, so, yeah, you guys, so, so um, I'm glad you mentioned all of that. So, yeah, let us know, you guys. Let us know your questions. Um, we're just here for you guys. And, yeah. uh, you know what? I meant to write down our topic for next week's oh, live. Do we um, have that I might available? be able to look. I should know this. I don't know if I can look. I think I can uh, look really quick. Yeah. Okay. You're going to um, look. Okay. Yeah, She's going to look. I'm going to look because <laughs> I want to tell you guys while we're talking. I'm going on today, so. I don't want to mess this up. I'll let Sean so. talk for a sec. Oh my gosh, I have the floor. Sean has to fill, oh my gosh. fill the void for just a second um, while I look up next week's yeah. live. Yeah, so 
Um, I don't Ooh. know what's coming up. We've got a lot of things coming okay. up, and we're scheduled out. What, what this is have? fun. I forgot. So we planned out for the next couple months, so we kind of forgot. Um, we're talking about ornamental grass types Ooh, next week. That'd be fun. And that's going to be on May 1st, next Saturday, cool. May 1st already. Cool. There's a lot of choices out there for ornamental grasses. Ornamental grasses. grasses. So yep. come with questions or suggestions or tips or anything. We'll be talking about different types of ornamental grasses yep. that you could add to your yard. Some get big, some stay yeah. small, some just mound, some cool. go straight up and they're narrow. That's uh, a fun one. And they're all different colors. There's there's bluish. Uh, there's the bluish teal, ones are cool. There's um, there's just like brown, which you think, I don't want a brown grass. Well, you might if you want that texture and look in your garden to contrast something Ooh, else. Or black so, mondo grass. Yeah, that's black a, mondo grass. Cool and the one. mondo grasses are like a whole category unto themselves. That's cool. So And, and we could possibly talk about mainly uh, maybe pompous grass. Yeah, pompous grass. We get a lot of questions one. about pompous yeah. grass. So, so it's going to be yeah. a two-parter. Next week we'll be talking about the types of ornamental grasses. The following week we'll talk about designing with ornamental grasses. Yeah, so it's kind of a twofer. Twofer. So we thought that might be fun so, to talk about and just explore a little bit with you guys. Yeah, so, totally. Yeah, so, that'll be fun. Yeah, so be there if you're interested. Uh, send us your questions ahead of time if you want to, too, if you want to know something specific on that. And we'll answer that and go through that on the live. Yeah. Again, Sean and Allison, all one word, at SpokenGarden.com. And Allison with two L's. Yeah, that's me. Got to make sure. So. Um, real quick, good morning, Dana. Hey. Thanks for joining. Hey, Dana. And... Um, yeah, you guys, we just, we appreciate you guys so much for being here, mm -hmm. and we love trying to interact with you guys. I'm, Always. again, trying to keep up with the chat. It's you hard. guys are having yeah. fun, and we're a little behind on that, but hope you guys have a wonderful weekend ahead yeah. in Thanks your for garden. being here, guys. Let us know what's going yep. on, and yeah, just take care. Yeah, we hope, we hope today was helpful with the uh, hummingbirds, and we look forward to seeing you next week. Yay. Yeah, so thanks, okay. guys. Thank you, guys. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.